first and the biggest thing that we can do. So let's talk about the uh, the House of And uh, this one, this one, I think is is to me the most fascinating of of how there is an el uh, evolution of this Pentecostal season into a, a time that that we recognize that we have in in the church today and in our own lives. But when we go back, we'll go back with a little scripture study, clear back to Luke chapter twenty four, which the Savior shared with his apostles. During uh, during the Last Supper, and we're we're reading so much in the Last Supper narratives about the uh, you know the sacrament about about the washing of feet, all those things that maybe we miss. That he says, <coughs> and ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Until ye be endued with power from on high. Now, this this King James language is pulling out of the Greek with that that word endued, which is a verb tense that we don't usually use with that that word of endow. Endow from the Greek means means to be clothed with, and so it means to receive a gift as if as if one was putting something on. So to be endued with power, and Jesus is telling these apostles, don't start your mission, don't start your mission until you get this, this power to cover you. It's, it's interesting that, that in Acts, after his resurrection, the Savior shows himself, this is verse 3 of Acts chapter 1, he showed himself alive after his passions by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So, so the Lord uh, tells the ancient apostles that there is power that will come to them before their their greatest and most significant mission. And he told the early saints that this would happen to them and, and this prophecy of, of power is, is the promise of why he brought them to Ohio. Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio and there I will give you my law and there, shall, and, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. See that all these things are preserved. And when men are endowed with power from on high and sent forth, all these things shall be gathered unto the bosom of the church. I, I like that the scripture word that is used is not just get an endowment or certainly not do an endowment. The, the word is that this is a, a something that you should receive. And what is it you're supposed to receive? power from on high. Those, those are the words repeatedly from the Lord. Now, the early saints thought they had that merit badge in June of 1831. In June of 1831, at the, at the conference of, of priesthood holders held in the, uh, the log schoolhouse on the Morley farm, the, uh, the power of the Lord was manifest to them, and they received they received an endowment of power. And they thought that's all there was to it. Now, amongst the things that they received, uh, if you remember our discussion on that conference, they received the spirit go. And it's a weird moment in church history until we realize that they are getting power. These priesthood holders are getting power and the power to discern the man of sin. I don't know that that's a power that we think about often that that the Lord promises to clothe us with a power to to discern the man of sin in the world and in our lives and uh, I, I think that is a, a power that we re still receive today but that wasn't the endowment of power that was part of it that was the beginning of it because then they gathered together in the school of the prophets in winter of 1833 and the Lord told them before they
they go out, he said, sanctify your minds, sanctify yourself that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time and in his own way and according to his own will. Tarry ye, tarry ye. And, and that's the reason why I've included this scripture in this, in this, set, in this context. This isn't a, a scripture where he says, you will be endowed with power, but this is the third time he says, don't go out yet. Tarry ye, tarry ye in this place, and call us all an assembly, even of those who are the first laborers in this last kingdom. Therefore, tarry ye and labor diligently, that you may be perfected in your ministry to go forth among the Gentiles for the last time as many as the mouth of the prophets shall name, to bind up the law and seal upon the testimony and to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment is to come. So the, uh, remember the stories that we told about the school of the prophets and the, the visions and the experiences, especially the record from Zebedee Coltrane, who talks about a, a discernment of, of being able to discern the Son and the Father, to recognize the presence of the deity. So there's another power that is clothed upon these saints, to recognize the power of God amongst us. And they thought they had received the endowment from on high. And then, in June of 1833, the Lord says, Yea, verily I say unto you, I gave unto you a commandment that you should build a house. In the which house I designed to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. For this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore, I command you to tarry even as mine apostles in Jerusalem. I, I hope you can see this pattern. This pattern through the scriptures of Jesus Christ telling his servants that the Father has a promise to give them. And the promise of the Father to them is an endowment with power from on high. I, I'm not keen on, on just completely changing Latter-day Saint <coughs> vocabulary because maybe this even feels and tastes a little too sacred to throw that word around. But the ordinances that the Lord is about to reveal in Kirkland <coughs> are not just a ceremony. It's not just a thing you do when you go to the temple. It is a promise of an endowment of power from on high. And as, as we put that into our brain, remember last week I, I challenged us as we think about the temple to, to remind ourselves that the Lord continually calls it my house. And as we put it into our brain that I'm going to the house of the Lord, that perhaps changes our temple worship. Rather than going to do an initiatory or going to do an endowment, we put it in our mindset that I'm going to the temple to be with Heavenly Father in his house. And while I am there, I will participate in baptisms for the dead. Right? Just that that mindset, we know the temple is holy, we feel it if, as we walk through those doors, but if we use our, that kind of brain vocabulary, the, uh, the, power of it, the power of it magnifies to us. And now when we talk about this ceremony, and, it, and, and we start thinking that, what is, what is this ceremony um, that is manifest to us with clothing? an endowment of power from on high that Heavenly Father promises those whom he has chosen before they go out unto the Gentiles that he is going to clothe them with power from on high including power to discern the adversary, power to discern the Father and the Son and power to go forth among the Gentiles and be clean in the midst of this, this corrupt world. Now, Orson Pratt, who was there, talks about this time and season. And I know this is kind of a longish quote, but I would really love to, to share this, have everybody note this, this from Elder Pratt. Is there anybody who can see clearly enough who wouldn't mind reading? Would you please? 
God was there, his angels were there, the Holy Ghost was in the midst of the people, the visions of the Almighty were opened to the minds of the servants of the living God, the veil was taken off from the minds of many, they saw the heavens opened, they beheld the angels of God, they heard the voice of the Lord, and they were filled from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet with the power and inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It was in that temple that the visions of the Almighty were opened to our great prophet, seer, and revelator, Joseph Smith, wherein the future was portrayed before him, wherein keys were committed to him in relation to this great latter-day dispensation, and the power of God was made manifest <coughs> through the holy priesthood sent down from heaven. In that temple, set apart by the servants of God, and dedicated by a prayer that was written by inspiration, the people were blessed as they had, as they never have been blessed for generations and generations. Now, Elder Pratt, thank you. Elder Pratt was in his twenties when he participated in this, in this season, this endowment of power. But what he remembers clear until uh, you know to the end of his life is that. God was there. His angels were there. The Holy Ghost was in the midst of his people. I, I've been preparing a lesson that I'm going to share in a couple Sunday school classes. For fifth Sunday, I've been invited to. But I've just been pondering on the difference between having a religious experience and having a spiritual experience. What it means to be spiritual and what it means to be religious. And why, why we, we cultivate our religious experiences so that we can have spiritual experiences. A communion with the spiritual realm, the heavenly realm. We pray so that we can have a spiritual experience. And whether your heart burns within you every time you pray, that's, that's not the point. The point is, in the act of prayer... You, you send your thoughts into the invisible world, right? You send your thoughts to Heavenly Father. As we open up our, our hearts to the Holy Ghost, we recognize that a divine personage from the eternal realm is coming into our, into our midst. And I testify that we frequently, we frequently are communing with the Holy invisible world and we know it not we are we are that close to being able to testify in our own lives God was there his angels were there the Holy Ghost was in the midst of the people and that just almost becomes a normal sensation for a latter day saint who is seeking to be endowed with power from on high you know, we, we, we maybe have blown it out of proportion when we say, well, I, I cried or I wept or my, I, I tingled all over. Those, those are side effects. Those are physical representations of this, this carnal world. But if, if we will let our minds, our hearts, and our spirits open themselves to eternity, we bear the same testimony as Elder Pratt. Let me... Let me show you how this evolution kind of happened to get to what in history we call the Kirtland Endowment. Now, this, this, is, this may have uh, connections to ordinances that you are familiar with that we don't, don't speak about because of their sacredness and our covenants. The Kirtland Endowment is the ancestor of those things and is, is open knowledge. Joseph Smith published these ordinances. So I, I do hope you not don't think that I'm I'm cheating on my covenants by speaking too openly about the Kirtland Endowment. But any connections that you might recognize I, I hope will burn in your, your own soul. But this ordinance really starts in the Whitney store at the time of the School of the Prophets, where the Lord commanded these men to gather themselves together and to arrive early and kneel in prayer uh, participate 
with a, with a uh, reverent salutation, which is not much different than expressions of love and gratitude and uh, what, yeah, what we do in our class. And then the members were cleansed by the ordinance of washing of feet, and the members partook of bread and wine. The washing of feet, of course, casts our mind back to the Last Supper when, when the Savior got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. That, that might not be the language you're familiar with in that verse from John 13. Um, you, we, we read the King James. I have, I have secretly made it a, a, a practice to use different versions of the Bible whenever I put these up here for, for a couple of main reasons. Number one, they're often more clear. Number two, I think it's a good thing for Latter-day Saints to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with different language than the habitual language we just King James repeat by rote. And number three, because my son, who is a seminary teacher, used a quote from the, the uh, NIV in a class and his principal scolded him. And so I'm proving that I am uh, the boss of his principal, and then he can't touch me. <laughs> but it's good, I think, because as pe as people are converted, they maybe they're maybe more familiar with different versions. Yeah. So theirs is at Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible is awesome. And you can put them side by side. And Sister Holland in her last yeah. address, she quoted. From Thessalonians in the new, um, what is it? NIV. NIV for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, here we've got the Amplified Bible as well. And the NASB. In yeah. 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 The, <coughs> I don't worry about so, so mostly, <laughs> I just want, I just want this unnamed principal uh, to to grow up. <laughs> but, but please remember that part of this ordinance was also. That while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the, for many for the forgiveness of sins. So, uh, you know, some of this some of this ordinance seems like it's it's some distant and far thing. But I, I want to put it in the context as an ancestor, uh, not not a not the posterity of what you and I know, because it's it's the doctrine and covenants commandment saying ye shall not receive any among you into this school save he is cleansed clean from the blood of this generation and he from the blood of this generation right that's the, that's the point. They've already been baptized for the remission of their sins, so they're being clean for a second thing. And he shall be received by the ordinance of washing of feet. For unto this end was the ordinance of washing of feet ordinate, or uh, instituted. And again, the ordinance of washing of feet is to be administered by the president or presiding elder of the church. It is to be commenced with prayer. And after the taking of bread and wine, he is to gird himself according to the pattern given in the 13th chapter of John's testimony concerning me. And so Joseph Smith gathers the elders together in the school of the prophets. And in the history of the church, he says, each elder washed his own feet first, after which I girded myself with the towel, washed the feet of all of them, wiping them with the towel with which I was girded. Um, and in the expression of this, many of the brethren saw a heavenly vision of the Savior and concourses of angels and many other things. So being cleansed qualified them to have that exchange with the unseen world, right? Um, we've talked about the school of the prophets. We we went through this in previous classes and and talked about the the glory of that. But now, after the school of the prophets experiences, President Smith and President Rigdon uh, go back to their primary occupation of translating the Bible and working with the Old Testament and they start learning Hebrew. And they, they immerse themselves in this Old Testament world, and the Lord in the Old Testament world teaches them uh, 
a little scripture study about Moses and Aaron. As the Lord said, then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Take the garments and dress Aaron with the tunic, the robe, the ephod, the ephod itself and the breast piece. Fasten the ephod on him by a skillful woven waistband. Put the turban on his head and attach the sacred emblem to the turban. Take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. So in the house of the Lord, as as Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams are organizing this, this to receive this prophesied endowment of power from on high, they see this ordinance to be taking place at the door of the tabernacle or at the uh, the entrance of the tent of meeting, right? So, so they be, they begin to think about this and they receive the revelations. And W.W. Uh, w. Phelps, who's a counselor in the in the presidency of the Church of Missouri. He's a counselor to David Whitmer, and that, that church presidency, which is what they called him, they didn't call him the state president, they, they called him the president of the church in Missouri. So that presidency has come to Kirtland for this event. And, and President Phelps writes this uh, experience back to his wife, in, who's still living uh, as a refugee in Clay County with the rest of the saints. Or, yeah, in Clay County. Um, can somebody please read President Phelps to us? Let me see, let me see clearly enough. Why not read today, Pam? Our meeting will grow more and more solemn and will continue till the great solemn assembly when the house is finished. We are preparing to make ourselves clean by first cleansing our hearts, forsaking our sins, forgiving everybody all we ever had against them, anointing, washing the body, putting on clean, decent clothes, by anointing our heads and by keeping all the commandments. As we come nearer to God, we see our imperfections and nothingness plainer and plainer. I would, I would like to uh, stop here, and that's why I put the uh, periodic table application on this one, is I'd like to just pause here and, and bounce this one to the class, seeking your commentary on what you've learned from President Phelps, maybe even about the endowment of power. And uh, I will sit down for two reasons. Number one, it's an educational strategy that shows you it's your turn to talk. <laughs> and secondly, I'm recovering from an injury. What injury, you ask? 1983 to 1995. <laughs> 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 Review that that uh, quote and share, please, any thoughts, feelings, or impressions that you're having. Come on, I sat down and I did this. <laughs> For me, it's new preparedness, new preparation for Sunday. What kind of preparation? significant soul check, right? <coughs> cleansing cleansing ourselves. Being cleansed by ordinance is making not as big a deal as that preparation. I like that. I said, was, was it over here? And then, then back over here. So I agree. I think the preparation is key. And um, last year I had the opportunity to work in the Temple of Awareness for 30 weeks. And at the Bountiful Temple they do it a little bit different. And so if you come without an appointment, there's a low chance you'll be able to get in, but sometimes you can. And so I found that in that capacity, I had to prepare myself the day before. Like, so I should have this day with me. So in the temple, when I was standing at that desk, I could, in a separate or two weeks, my Heavenly Father can help me to know who needs to go and what I need to do here. And if I was prepared, and if I listened to the Spirit, 100% of the time, everything worked the way it was supposed to work. If I wasn't prepared and tried to do it my own way, it fell apart and it was a mess. But I could see, so as I've been, like, as I was reading in faith about how they were so prepared, they had read the scriptures, they were prepared for this endowment, that 
they did have the word power, and they could have. And, and so can you. And I, I love having that experience in your temple. I'm having a hard time seeing that in my own life outside of temple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, here, and then Mackenzie, was it you? I saw another one over here, but we'll go here. That, that you reminded us that the taking of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was and is part of this whole thing. It's not, it's not a separate ordinance. It's a piece of the, the bigger endowment with power. And over here, yes. seem to paint for us to be aware of our imperfections as a shameful or an embarrassing thing, right? It is an enlightening thing. Thank you for showing me this thing. Thank you for, for teaching me. Thank you for correcting me. I, I particularly, I'm very grateful for your comments, and I, I especially want you to notice that one of President Phelps's points for personal preparation was forgiving everybody. just assumed that was uh, President Phelps' way of writing in 1836, but he made that. And not to me right now. <laughs> but, but it's delightful that the Holy Ghost, either either <laughs> President Phelps meant something or you learned independently yep. a, a divine truth. Just looking at it, how often do we do it backwards? And he ends with the outward keeping all the commandments and wearing decent clothes. <coughs> and how often do we do that backwards? Well, I'm keeping all the commands, whatever. But he says, first, cleansing my heart, and then outward, 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 and doings, keeping all the commandments. And so how how the Lord really looks at our heart first. And and the forgiving part is true. For he says, forgiving everybody, all we have had against him, that makes us really hard. <laughs> it's a big deal, right? And it is really hard. <laughs> because uh, 
I still hold a grudge against Elba High School. <laughs> for cheating us out of a state championship in 1983. For me, it's uh, focusing your mind and body. Just a Jew should be cutting everything else out and narrowing your scope down. I agree. And so let's talk about some of the side effects. So Joseph Smith says, at about 3 o'clock p.m., I dismissed the school and the presidency, or I dismissed the school, and the presidency retired to the loft of the printing office, where we attended to the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water. We also perfumed our bodies and our heads in the name of the Lord. This is kind of a cool thing. I wish we could convince our cousins of the community of Christ to rebuild this. The, the printing office, a regular-sized uh, Kirtland building for the time next to the temple. I, think, I hope that helps us see how magnificent the temple is not only now, but it absolutely would have been to them because they go to the, the attic floor of the printing office, which they're using as their, their church headquarters, and there at, at the doors of the tabernacle or, or the entrance to the tent of the congregation, they, they washed themselves with pure water and uh, perfumed their bodies and our heads in the name of the Lord. The perfume they used was uh, whiskey and cinnamon, <laughs> which... Uh, well, it's alcohol, 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 which is a very good statement. And, and what do we know about uh, strong drinks? means that the, this initial uh, endowment smelled like a uh, University of Wyoming football game. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize that smell anyway. <laughs> then, they, then they retired to the third floor. Now this is the East Room. Uh, this, this ordinance would happen in the West Room, but I just like this, this, old, uh, this old picture of it in its natural state. But you just come up the stairs and onto a landing, and then you go into the east room, and you pass through these these four other rooms to come into the quorum room, the uh, the furthest to the west. And while gathered there, <coughs> this is all Joseph Smith. At early candlelight, I met with the presidency at the west at the west schoolroom in the temple to attend to the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil. Also, the councils of Kirtland and Zion met in the two adjoining rooms and waited in prayer while we attended to the ordinance. So uh, the presidency, the patriarch, and the two bishops, uh, two bishoprics, go into the quorum room. So the high council of Kirtland are in one room, and the high council of, of Zion, the, the Missouri high council, have come all the way, all 12 of them, uh, 15 of them, because the presidency, have come all the way from Missouri to participate in this, this special day of Pentecost, this special outpouring of the Spirit. We then laid our hands upon aged Father Smith and invoked the blessings of heaven. I then anointed his head with the consecrated oil and sealed many blessings upon him. The presidency then in turn <coughs> laid their hands upon his head, beginning at the <coughs> oldest, until they had all laid their, their hands upon him and pronounced such blessings upon his head as the Lord put into their hearts. Oh, she's cool. She just wanted to give you another hug. Uh, and I, I would not oppose. Can I have another hug, please? Now everybody makes you nervous. I'll let you stay. I'll let you stay. I then took the seat, and Father anointed my head, and sealed upon me the blessings of Moses to lead Israel in the latter days, even as Moses led them in, in days of old, and also the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Power. An endowment of power from on high. Now, if you think about these things, in a couple of days from this time, or months, Joseph Smith will receive keys to use those powers, right? The, the, the power was bestowed upon him 
in this endowment of power. All of the presidency laid their hands upon me and pronounced upon my head many prophecies and blessings, many of which I shall not notice at this time. Uh, and I, I like the way he says it. That he, he says, after I'm not going to talk about the blessings they put on my head because let us come to visions and revelations. I've got something else I want to tell you about. After, after this ceremony of, of anointing and blessing and sealing with, with the first presidency and, and the eighth patriarch and, the, uh, and Partridge and, and Whitney, these holy, holy men who have prepared their hearts and forgiven each other, Joseph Smith uh, has that experience where the, the veil is opened and an experience is very identical to other experiences we have in the scriptures. Like where Isaiah, in chapter 6, passes through the doors and he sees a heavenly host and he sees God seated on his throne. Or John the Beloved in, in the book of Revelation 3 and 4. These, these sacred experiences match as Joseph sees the heavens open, the veil is parted, and he sees into the celestial kingdom of God, the holy of holies, the, the, the heavenly realm. And the glory thereof, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which is like unto the circling flames of fire, the glory of God, which stands as a veil in a gate between our uh, corporeal world and the invisible world. And the blazing throne of God whereon was seated the Father and the Son. I saw the beautiful streets of that kingdom which had the appearance of being paved with gold. I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father and mother and my brother Alvin that had long since slept. That We use that verse to talk about the Alvin Smith principle which is the uh, which is the asterisk on, on those who have died without receiving it the ordinance of the gospel, right? It is the promise that those who would have received them, if they'd been given a fair chance, I, I really believe in emphasizing that because for a while, as a 19-year-old kid in Peru, I would walk away from people's doorstep thinking, well, I hope you enjoy the terrestrial kingdom. <laughs> I, I testify they, did, they have not been given a fair chance because it was too I cannot be anybody's full opportunity to know the gospel, right? But uh, you know how cool this would have been for Joseph Smith to be bearing that testimony to the men that are standing in that room? Because who is who is standing in that room at this very second? He's, his dad. I saw you and mom and Alvin with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and surely... Surely, uh, Sarah, Rachel, and Rebecca, and uh, Rebecca and Rachel, and, and Hagar, and Hannah, and all the holy m women, the, 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 uh, the hosts of the Most High who surround the throne of God. That's the only part that's canonized into our scripture, but the vision goes on. I saw the twelve apostles of the Lamb who are now upon the earth who hold the keys of this last ministry in foreign lands, standing together in a circle, much fatigued, and their clothes tattered, tattered and their feet swollen, with their eyes cast downward, and Jesus standing in their midst. They did not behold him. The Savior looked upon them and wept. I, I, I think that is a prophecy of the twelve going certainly to, uh, to England and Great Britain at that time, and while we talk about phenomenal success with uh, Elder Woodruff and, uh, and Elder Taylor and President Young and, and the 12 that, that were there, missionary work is a hard experience. And I wish I would have known this one too when I was 19. Not only would I have not you know, cast people to the terrestrial world, but uh, I stood in zone conferences with our clothes tattered and our feet swollen and our eyes cast downward because it was hard. And sometimes we stand in elders' corner 
he needs, and in presidency meetings, and in Relief Society gatherings. And we stand together, and we talk about our ministry, and we are much fatigued, and our clothes are tattered, and our feet are swollen, and I've really, really tried hard to get that family back to the kingdom. I've really, really tried hard to, to get my cousin or my sister or my, my neighbor and it's just not working out. And if we could see into the invisible world and have that spiritual experience, which is to be created from our physical experience, we would see Jesus standing in our midst. And even though we do not behold him, he sees us with compassion. He knows that missionary work is hard. He knows that ministering is hard. He knows that uh, raising a family is hard, and he weeps with us. He also, by the way, saw, saw Brigham Young, specifically Elder Young, standing in the midst of a people of color, preaching the gospel to them. What does that mean? Does that mean, does that mean the Lamanites, the, 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 the Shoshone and the youth that that President Young would meet when he got to Utah? I don't know. Look at Ken Rock for a second. I almost believe it's a, a reference to feast that President Young did on the other side of the veil. Yeah. All right. <coughs> oh, wait, no, I want to say this. The visions of heaven were open to them also. Some of them saw the face of the Savior. Others were ministered to by holy angels, and the spirit of prophecy and revelation was poured out in mighty power, and loud hosannas, and glory to God in the highest, saluted the heavens. For we all communed with the heavenly host. And I saw in my vision all the presidency in the celestial kingdom of God, many others that were present. As we go to the house of the Lord for whatever ordinance we do, the symbolism of being in the presence of the host of the Lord is manifest to us by the, the hundreds of workers who, who stand at our, basically beck and call when we go to the temple. As, as I would teach temple prep lessons in, in times past, I would, I would tell people, don't be afraid. There is no way, there is impossible to do the wrong thing in the temple. I dare you, just try. Try to go to the wrong walk. <laughs> Try to go down the wrong hall. <laughs> there, there, is, there is a ministering angel standing at every portal. There is somebody who doesn't know that their full calling as a ministering angel is just to do this. <laughs> but that that symbolism, that symbolism testifies to us of what we are not seeing in the invisible world. As, as, as we live our lives but don't recognize that, that the, the ministering angels are all around us, as Elder Holland has said, both seen and unseen, both mortal and immortal. So then on Friday the 22nd, they bring in the, uh, the Quorum of the Twelve. We laid our hands upon Elder Thomas B. Marsh, who is president of the Twelve, and ordained him to the authority of anointing his brethren. I then poured the consecrated oil upon his head in the name of Jesus Christ, and sealed such blessings upon him as the Lord put into my heart. The rest of the presidency then laid their hands upon him and blessed him, each in his turn, beginning at the oldest. He then anointed and blessed his brethren from the oldest to the youngest. I also laid my hands upon them and pronounced many great and glorious things upon their heads. The heavens were opened, and angels ministered to us. President Rigdon arose to conclude the services of the evening by invoking the blessing of heaven upon the Lord's anointed, which he did in an eloquent manner. The congregation shouted a long hosanna. The gift of tongues fell upon us in mighty power. Angels mingled their voices with ours while their presence was in our midst and unceasing praises swelled our bosoms for the space of half an hour. Then on the 28th of January, the high priests are invited in, and the high priests are put in the quorum room, and the elders are put in the schoolroom, and the 70s 
in the, in the next school room. And while this is happening, Elder Sylvester Smith of the Presidency of the Seventy saw a pillar of fire resting on the heads of the apostles. Roger Orton saw six angels surround the temple to protect the saints. William Smith, the, 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 the apostle, the prophet's, uh, you know, scratchy brother, <laughs> saw the heavens open and the Lord's host protecting the anointed. Zebedee Coltrane, again the visionary soul, saw a vision of the Savior crowned with glory upon his head above the brightness of the sun. Joseph Smith saw a glorious vision. Some spoke in tongues and prophesied. And, and these, these leaders received these ordinances and have these experiences so that they can now cascade them to the next, to the next level. So they bring in the quorums. And the elders quorum, now the, the, the presidency have received their ordinance, now the brethren are brought in, the, the uh, various members of those quorums. And do you remember what the high councils were doing while Joseph Smith was anointing the first presidency? They were in other, other rooms praying. That was a significant part of the ordinance, is that the people who were not having the experience were praying for people that were having the experience. And that manifests itself when the quorums are brought in. He called the anointed together to receive the seal of all their blessings. I labored with each of these quorums for some time to bring them to the order which God had shown me. He needs them to do it in a specific way. And God had shown him the way it is to be done, and part of that included reverent prayer. Um, but apparently, they're, they're not just responding to a simple invitation, right? He has to labor for this to happen, and it's got to be in a specific way. Um, kind of like what we just heard about the Bountiful Temple. Did, he, did anybody else wonder when you started your what you were saying about the Bountiful Temple and you said, we do it differently? <laughs> you meant the people who come to participate, not the ordinance. Yes, not the ordinance. <laughs> right. 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 Because yeah. Sorry, it's not bad. there is an order which God had shown to me. I had considerable trouble to get all the quorums in, united in this order. I went from room to room repeatedly and charged each separately, assuring them that it was according to the mind of God. Notwithstanding all my labor, while I was in the East Room with the Bishop's Quorum, I felt by the Spirit that something was wrong in the, the Quorum of Elders in the West Room. So he sends Hiram, and some of them replied that they had a teacher of their own, and they did not wish to be troubled by others. This caused the Spirit of the Lord to withdraw. This interrupted the meeting, and this Quorum lost their blessing in a great measure. Sometimes we do have, a, not, not necessarily even a streak of rebellion, but a streak of independence, don't we? That, that, that we, we have hourly, we know the way we want it to go. We don't need, we don't need somebody from the next level telling us that there is an order to do things. And I just picture Joseph Smith knowing from the past three days that he's had in the temple, the experience that all these people ought to be having in the temple, and they're not, because he just, just won't listen, just won't humble themselves to do it the way he's trying to tell them to do it. But the other quorums were more careful, and the quorum of the 70 enjoyed a great flow of the Holy Spirit. Many arose and spoke, testifying that they were filled with the Holy Ghost, which was like fire in their bones. So they could not behold their peace. They could not hold their peace. But they were constrained to cry, Hosanna to God and the Lamb, the glory of the highest. These experiences all happen before the temple is dedicated, which we'll talk about next week. But then, after the dedication of the temple, uh, the ordinance of washing was administered to about 300 priesthood orders. And then on April 6th, the ordinance was repeated for about 400 men. Now, the, the ordinance will evolve again when we get to Nauvoo to include our sisters. But this part, this part was about the brethren receiving their ordinances. But Joseph said of this occasion, I left the meeting in the charge of the 12 and retired about 9 o'clock in the evening. <coughs> 
I love that. That's a first statement that presiding officers don't have to be there all the time, anywhere all the time, right? Joseph Smith himself said, this one, we got this. And he retired about nine in the evening. The brethren continued exhorting, prophesying, and speaking in tongues until five o'clock in the morning. The Savior made his appearance to some while angels ministered, ministered to others. It was a Pentecost, an endowment deed, long to be remembered, for the sound shall go forth from this place into all the world, and the occurrence of this day shall be handed down upon the pages of sacred history to all generations. It's the day of Pentecost. So shall this day be numbered and celebrated as a year of jubilee, the time of rejoicing to the saints of the Most High God. You ever had a tough time uh, with meetings? You ever had a tough time leading people in meetings? These guys couldn't leave a meeting because they were having a spiritual experience. You want to sit around and just uh, talk about ward gossip? I got about 15 minutes of it. And you'll, you know, the forum will take another 45. But uh, if we're having a spiritual experience, I can't hear the bell. Amen? Amen. I know that's true. Elder Rich, who is not an apostle at this point, but he will be. He, Elder Rich will be the first apostle called by the Quorum of the Twelve after the death of Joseph Smith. But he will say, we then continued to fast and pray until the setting of the sun. When we broke bread and drank wine, we prophesied all night, pronouncing blessings and cursings upon uh, until the morning light. There was great manifestation of the power of God. I was filled with spirit of prophecy, and I was endued with power from on high. And this is our last <coughs> one. Young Elder Woodruff says, the veils being closed, we entered the elder's pulpit. And there upon our knees we pled with God, and we covenanted with each other in the holy stand that we would not give sleep to our eyes, neither take food until we received a blessing from God by the outpouring of his spirit upon us. And it was until the end of, of three days, and according to our covenant, we commenced praying. And a part of that night, we had a severe trial of our faith by great temptation from Satan. But before day, we gained a, great, a good degree of victory over the devil. And the Lord poured out his spirit upon us, and we felt it good to be in the house of God while nature was hushed in silence by the, sa by the subtle shades of night. This, this ancestor of spiritual experiences shouldn't stand unique to us. There, there, none of us that should say, oh, if I could go back to the 1836 ceremonies because that, that was the ancestor. We believe that God has continued to roll out the restoration, which means those things we have now, those things we have now are a piece of this. And our faith and our faithfulness will, uh, will respond in our ability to recognize, to discern the, de the devil among us and to recognize the, the presence of God and angels in our midst. That's my faith. That's my prayer that will happen to all of us in the name of Jesus <coughs> Christ. Amen. Amen. Before we pray, anybody that's not gotten onto the... Uh, the link. I'll send out my slides if you want them. Who's going to pray for us? Please, please. Okay. Thanks, everybody.